welcome to an exciting panel this morning. And as a Toronto born and raised individual who's traveled the world, it gives me delight and pleasure to welcome you back to Toronto for CyBoss. Um, and this morning we have a fantastic panel talking about something that I am very passionate about. It's corporates, it's payments, it's combining it together and making the world be that much more efficient in the way that we deliver propositions to our end consumers, clients, whether they're individuals or businesses. So we have a stacked panel this morning, and along, me, along with me this morning, we've got Christian uh, Frederick, who joins us from Deutsche Bank. Welcome, Christian. Thank we've got you. David Rigo, who joins us from Standard Charter. Welcome. Thank you. Long, you're the furthest traveled, correct, from That's Singapore? Right. Thank you. He's not jet lagged because he spent a week <laughs> in New York. That's right. We've got Judy Lee, who joins us from Payments Canada. Good morning. Good morning. And then we also have Arthur, who said to me, I go by AJ MacArthur, who comes to us from Bank of America. So we have a stacked panel, which also means that, yes, we have prepared questions. <clears throat> but equally the best questions come from the audience. So as a quick nudge to you all, please do use the Slido app for those of you in the room and also for those of you who are joining us remotely. Slido will be the vehicle through which we take your questions and we'll be able to share them with the panel itself. So kicking things off, we always like to start things with a very base. And the base itself is going to be a question for Judy. To help us understand ISO, I know that there's at least 90% of the room that knows what I'm talking about. But just for that 10% that may not, I'm going to get Judy to give us a little bit of a 101, Judy, on ISO itself through the lens of Payments Canada or more broadly and what it means for all of us as we look to the future. Absolutely. So I know we have some ISO nerds in the audience. I recognize a few faces and I, <laughs> I know some are online. But for people who are new to ISO and want to learn, what is ISO 20022? So the textbook version is ISO 20022 is a financial uh, messaging standard that it has this framework that allows uh, international agreed uh, business syntax, semantics and processes. It sounds quite boring. So usually I like to use an analogy. Think about this. ISO 2022 is the common language that could be potentially understood by all the payment systems around the world. So the industry is looking at it, not only because it's global, it can be used in, it is being used by uh, Canada's high value system, it can be used in a real time system in Brazil or a batch system in Japan. Also, unlike the current messaging standard and the legacy messaging standard, it brings rich and structured data. We probably all have heard that data is the new oil in the digital age. With that extra and accurate information, a lot can be done. I mean, every player in this ecosystem can benefit from the adoption. We're talking about things like improved efficiency, interoperability, and unleash new business opportunities. So if you it's the first time you're hearing about ISO. I had rec recommend you, you know, read a little bit more about it. We're talking about it everywhere. But today, we're talking about ISO extending the benefits to corporates. What does that mean? So we're, I know we're going to dive into it. One thing that came to my mind is um, a lot of friends um, who work in opera, corporates have complained about the delay and confusion um, you know, introduced by the lack of information when the, during reconciliation between, say, incoming payments and invoices and purchasing orders. And ISO 2022 will introduce structured remittance information elements. If we're looking at end-to-end -end adoption, if we're all, or we're all on board, we're looking at eliminate or at least ease the pain. So what are we talking about when we talk about ISO for corporates? We're talking about improved payment experience for both corporates and their clients. Exactly how and what are the challenges? I'm sure we'll dive into it. We will most definitely dive into it. Thank you, Judy. My question now is going to be a little bit broader. I'm going to come to you, Christian, first. And, you know, we've got ISO today, Interbank. Talk to us a little bit about the benefits that we're already starting to see in the current status of where we are. Thank you, Raman. Um, I want to um, base it on, on what Judy said. So ISO is a common language and provides rich information which could be uh, traveled with the payment message. And the common language is the benefit and as well the challenge. And I think at this point in time, it's already maybe a little bit premature to really talk about benefits since this common language need to settle in the industry. And if you look into adoption rates, and I think it has been quoted yesterday in the opening plenary as well, we have 15% of all Cy uh, SWIFT messages currently 
using the common language of ISO 2022, and there is yet a way to go to really realize the benefits which we all hope and see that at one point in time cross-border payments are frictionless, more real-time or almost instant, better reconciliation and all the things that I think have been mentioned um, multiple times. And the challenges which I see why I believe it's premature to talk about materialized benefits at this point in time is around two things. One is the adoption. It's the breadth of the adoption and the depth of the adoption. So breadth meaning common language. Everybody needs to talk the common language and the entire industry needs to adopt ISO 2022, needs to be able to send messages and receive messages. And it's the depth of adoption. It doesn't help if we only adopt ISO 2022 as being able of receiving it, we need to process it natively within our mm -hmm. systems to create benefits for the financial industry as well as for the corporates. And the second thing is about data. Julie mentioned this common language and rich information. It doesn't help if we provide a lot of data crap into the system and all of a sudden experience or expect magic happening within the payments industry. So payment, the data quality within payments is key as well to really realize the benefits. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I know, AJ, you've got a perspective. Yeah, on it. maybe to add on. So I, I agree. I think the benefits have been modest so far, but we are starting to see um, some benefits uh, in the ISO data. So, you know, things that we're seeing are um, increased use of the structured address field is starting to be filled in a little bit. Um, the, the long name field is starting to be filled in a little bit. And the other thing that we're seeing uh, is uh, increased use of the reference uh, information and particularly the transaction ID. Um, and just, again, a, a modest benefit that we're seeing from you know, adding that transaction ID or reference data um, is ease of investigations um, and quicker investigations, which helps both you know, the, the FI and the end corporate. So again, I think much more benefits to come as we increase the adoption, um, but starting to see some, some modest things come through. Terrific. Um, I can see the questions are coming in, so thank you very much for those who have submitted, and a nudge again for those who haven't, please do get those questions in. Um, now we're going to get the crystal ball out and say it's here. We, we are now ready and we're thinking about the future. We'll start with the banks first and then my next question is going to be towards the corporates, which is the reason for this conversation this morning. But let's start with the banks first. So fast forward the clock, we've moved from where we are today in Interbank and it's now live. What do you see as the benefits for the banks themselves? And for that question, I'm going to come to you, David, first. Okay, thanks for that. So I think, uh, you know, my fellow panelists have, have mentioned the limited benefits that we see now. It's, it's, it's going to be like that for a few months, I reckon. But I think the, the important thing is that the journey has, has you know, truly well begun, 15% in six months, and we know we see that will go, go up. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that as an industry, we, we focus on the benefits that we will get out of this as a community. Uh, for banks, that obviously means you know, using this transition period uh, to really start doing you know, better analysis on the data that's coming in, where is it breaking, what opportunities do we have for STP, um, you know, how can we you know, fine tune, tweak things around sanctions, frauds, monitoring, all of those, those pieces of uh, very important uh, processes that we have to run. Because um, in the long run, we do see uh, opportunities for improved STP, we will definitely see much better with the structured data that you mentioned, the, you know, the address fields, uh, better information will even help banks on doing better reconciliation on their Nostro Vostros. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's other benefits around you know, new use cases that, and I see a question up here, <laughs> around use cases that we could extend to corporates as well. Um, so I think the, you know, if you break up where the benefits would really come up, there'd obviously be operational benefits that we would see, which, you know, hopefully reduces costs. Uh, much more effective risk management is what I see happening because the data, you know, have to deal with, you know, Christine made a very good point about the quality, but, you know, in the hope that the quality is good, I think from a risk management perspective, it really will get much more effective because we have the data to deal with. And that is, in fact, even true for corporates because they will also be able to use that data. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, a, lot, a number of our clients in Asia, uh, broker-dealer clients particularly, you know, have to make sure that when an incoming deposit comes onto an account from you know, a retail client of theirs, it has to come from an account in the same name, which today we are having to do through all types of you know, convoluted workarounds mm -hmm. to make that happen. But you could imagine that if this, if this now becomes default standard for payments to, work, to flow through, 
you actually have that happening as happening is just par for the course. So I think there's there's those benefits which we need to really look for as we go through this journey. Because I think if we if we stop and try to measure everything up before we start, yeah. there's a question here on a business case. I think you're not allowed to answer them we yet. Will <laughs> <struggle>. <laughs> so we will that. <laughs> so, yeah. so you know, I think I think it's about staying with the journey, like anything. You know, keep practicing, practicing. I think I think we will see that. But it's operational cost, effective risk management, and I think eventually for the corporates, us as well to ab to be able to offer services to the corporates as well as for corporates to use that data themselves. I think this. For sure. The, the, the word seamless comes to mind as you're speaking yeah. about it, David, for sure. AJ, I know you've got a perspective to share as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I agree. I think you know, as the adoption increases, we're going to see enormous benefits. And I think some of it's going to come from the structured aspect of the data. I think some of it's going to come from the rich aspect of the data. Um, and some of it's going to come actually from the combination of the two. Um, as, as I think about it, I think about you know, what are the various processes that we um, run within the bank? Um, and how do those processes use data? And how are those processes going to change? Um, so, you know, one way that we all use data within our banks is we have to interpret data. Um, and, you know, we're, we're receiving data from our corporate clients, we're receiving data from other banks, and we have to interpret it in some way. And the more structured the data is, um, the better we're going to be able to interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you mentioned, you know, one area where we have to interpret data quite frequently is in compliance um, and sanction screening. Uh, and the better we're able to interpret data, the, the fewer false positives we're going to have, um, the fewer um, requests for information we're going to have, and the greater sort of straight through processing. So I think that's one. Um, you know, another way that we use data is we evaluate it to draw conclusions. Um, and the richer the data that we have, the better we're able to evaluate it and draw those conclusions. And one area where you know, we all as banks are evaluating data and drawing conclusions is fraud monitoring. Mm -hmm. So the, the richer the data we can feed our fraud tools, um, the smarter we can make the tools, or the smarter the tools can themselves be, and the more effective they're going to be. Um, and then the third thing I think that's going to be powerful about this is we're going to be able to combine different elements of data together that we haven't before. Um, so I would argue that this is actually the first time we have an opportunity to take payments data and what has traditionally been accounting data, and it's all going to be in one place, and it's all going to be nice and neat um, and, and easy to analyze. So I think there's going to be enormous benefits for the banks, um, and in turn to pass on to the corporates to be able to analyze that data together and to provide insights. To drive efficiency, for sure. Um, I'm going to come to you, Christian, now. Now we're going to pivot, and you can see the questions are now piling up on corporate and benefits to corporate. So if I, again, with the crystal ball, we're now here, what do you see as those major benefits to corporates using ISO data in the future? Well, I think we already covered a lot of things which are relevant from a banking perspective as well as from a corporate perspective. And the point in time, we, from a banking perspective, are able to execute payments with much higher STP rates, less false positives, less investigations on top of it, the corporate ultimately will benefit at the same point in time because it gets much more predictable for the corporate to um, initiate cross-border payments. I think one, one piece to add to, to this ISO 2022 topic is from a corporate perspective, the harmonization of payment initiation. Mm. Many countries use ISO 2022 for their domestic payment schemes already. Now with cross-border payments moving to ISO 2022, at one point in time, crystal ball, hopefully the standards are aligned as well. The corporate could initiate a payment as a pain 001 with an SLA tag to it, and the banks decide on the best way how to execute it instead of today the corporate needs to worry about all of um, the hassles around it. And the other thing has been quoted as well, structured data, much more information that can travel with the payment, ultimate debt or ultimate creditor enabling on behalf of payments. I think there are a lot of value add use cases from the payment message in itself and its structure as well as from data analytics on top that corporates can expect. But it has to be a journey together with the banks and I think we, we jointly need to work on those, on those things to make it a benefit for the banking industry as for the corporates. For sure. David, I know you've, you've got a, we kind of prepped in the session, you said you've got a, an opinion on this one. Yeah, I think um, you know. The, the, I, I think it's almost like the baseline expectation is is the rich data helps with things like reconciliation, you know, faster cash application, you know, better cash flow forecasting. So I think that that's almost like the baseline, and then there's you know, reduced friction from you know false positives and and the like will will also obviously make payments uh, faster and and more certain. So that's almost like the baseline expectation that I think even when ISO 2002 started, this was the expectation. Uh, 
but you know, to the point that Christine was making around harmonization of uh, you know payment standards across different uh, payment schemes, uh, I think that's a massive upside for for corporates if they take the route of you know getting onto the ISO 20022 uh, standards. Uh, because we're seeing, for example, even in Asia, there's a lot of interlinking of payment systems already happening. So I think the signs are already there that, you know, in the industry, this is going to, 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 to pick up. So we have, you know, bilaterals right now happening, for sure, between payment schemes, but that's also picking up into now regional. For example, ASEAN is talking about interlinking their instant payment schemes. So, so I think that's, that's, that's one of the things that you know, corporates should consider when, when they're looking at this because your payment instruction then becomes much simpler to Christian's point. Um, there's the, the on behalf of, so you know, the whole Pobo Robo, which in the past had to be put into different fields in an empty, which you know, now you can actually get directly through the structured <coughs> data is, is another uh, element that I think will be extremely helpful for, you know, the more sophisticated corporates who want to do Pobo Robo. Um, there's uh, potential use cases that we could see on uh, supply chain finance mm -hmm. with the, uh, you know, structured remittance information that's available. That's, again, you know, something that can be explored and, you know, banks need to look at that quite seriously on how we can uh, look at using that remittance information to, to come up with options around supply chain finance. I think that's, that's another one. Um, and then, of course, that can also be, you know, the other thing I was thinking about you know, over the last few days is can that information be used even for, you know, the regulatory stuff. So a number of the markets we operate in Standard Charter, there's, you know, you have to show proof of payment, the underlying invoice, all of that stuff. And, you know, we have scanned documents going back and forth between the client and, and the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, is there room to work with regulators to, again, use that structured remittance information to, you know, seamlessly enable that payment flow and, you know, take away that friction. So that's another one. And probably the last one that you know, I kind of mentioned earlier is even for, for corporates on the compliance side, mm -hmm. um, you know, the data will help strengthen things like fraud monitoring, you know, the broker dealer example that I gave. I think, you know, if we look, I wouldn't even say look hard enough. I think if we look enough, I think we will see how that data can potentially even, you know, assist corporates uh, on that journey. Just one thing to add what, what, what David mentioned. I think on the regulatory part, that's, that's an important one. Now, with purpose code information being a explicit field in the ISO message, I think it's much easier to support those local use cases, which mm -hmm. specifically you see in the Asian market where you need to explain why do you do the payment and what's the benefit or what's the rationale behind and why does it need to reach the end beneficiary. Whereas on the NT world, we put it in what in any kind of remittance information field <coughs> and banks had to interpret yes. what it's for. It leads to manual processes and requests for information. So. I think the information and the structure in itself is a benefit for the corporates, yet they need to provide the data in the right format that banks can handle it. For sure. Yeah, maybe just, I was just going to add to that. So, you know, I, I agree definitely with, with all the benefits, but I think that's, that's one thing that's necessary for all these benefits to be realized is that the corporates themselves need to actually fill in these yes. new fields, right? And, and, and provide the rich data so we can, you know, provide all these things that we're talking about here. And then I think it's incumbent on us as the FI community to be able to describe to our corporate clients what are the benefits, um, you know, what are the use cases, what's the ROI, what's the reason why they should change their processes um, in, in order to, um, you know, adopt these new formats and, and uh, provide the rich data to be able to receive the benefits. And I, I think one thing, too, um, that we need to sort of, you know, train and advocate with our corporates is they themselves also need to advocate further with their ERP providers um, because the, the corporates, well, they can change their processes. They're also dependent uh, to some extent on the, the systems they use. So I think it's really sort of a, a three-legged stool of, you know, we, the FIs, being able to ingest this data and provide insights and um, experiences back to the corporates, the corporates changing their processes, but then the corporates advocating with their ERPs, and the ERPs also changing their tools so that we can all work together um, to realize the benefits. It's a full value chain from beginning to end in terms exactly. of actually optimizing and creating that sense of value through ISO, no doubt. There's going to be lots of adoption challenges. I know this is a key question that we were thinking about as well. In addition to what you just mentioned, AJ, anything else to add from others before we go to the panel questions? Well, I think one thing which, which AJ already highlighted around the adoption and specifically on the corporate side, there needs to be a lot of training material and education which banks have to provide to their corporates and their service providers in order to make them familiar with what ISO and the corporate bank uh, on the, on the cross-border space means and what it means on their end. 
including explicitly explaining the standards around ISO 2022. I think people assume, and I mentioned earlier, crystal ball in the future, hopefully we have one standard. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if we talk to corporates today, they may think of ISO 2022. And in Europe, they, are, if they know the SEPA area where you have a ISO standard, which is different to what we have defined as a banking industry and CBPR plus. And I believe it's the same in almost every region of the world. So educating that a there is a difference and we need to come closer together to bridge this difference is a, is a key ingredient to be successful and making sure they see the benefit of when they do exactly. <laughs> apply to that as well great i know judy you were going to give yeah. us a little bit of a market infrastructure <coughs> view as well in terms of benefits in e that new exactly concern. so payments canada we're a market infrastructure operator we don't really work with corporates directly but it does not mean we don't have a role to play you know, I love the first question, you know, come here is how do we overcome the discrepancies in understanding the same, uh, the new language by many uh, different dialogues. That's something, you know, at Payments Canada, we care deeply because uh, the coherence of the adoption is important. If that one language, everyone speaks in you know, different accents, defeats the purpose. So um, at Payments Canada, um, we try to play an active role there. Um, for example, earlier this year, um, the high value system links went live with the support of MX messages, um, but our work did not stop there. So the ISO team at Payments Canada is actually working with the industry at the moment on developing messaging guidelines in the corp to bank space. So the goal is really to help the um, industry to understand and have, you know, build this best practices around uh, formatting the messages um, that are used between corporates and banks. So they're in line, they're aligned with the links packs messages. Uh, again, the coherence of the adoption is key. And, um, you know, I think everyone has a part to play. For sure. And I mean, we've got global banks represented. That question that, uh, Mario, thank you very much for your question. How to overcome discrepancies in understanding the new language by many dialects? Um, we're in a unique position here in Canada, given the diversity of the country itself. So we <laughs> deal with it within its borders, but would love a, love a kind of perspective, David, Christian, AJ, from your vantage point. Yeah, you, you know, just to pick up on the point that AJ made around the ERPs and stuff like that, I, th I think that community with the banks and corporates has to get much tighter on this on this journey in order to, to make sure those dialects are simplified and we get to that common standard. I think there's other pieces around, you know, helping corporates, you know, the education piece, but even helping them understand what does this journey mean. You know, there's, there's really basic stuff around what does a real migration plan look like to move to ISO. You know, what, what kind of testing ability do, you know, banks and ERP providers work with these corporates, right? You need to probably help them out with, you know, test scenarios, test cases, helping them automate testing. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, you know, test environments that need to be made available, you know, giving them a sense of what it takes to spend uh, of, the, of the expense to move down this road. Um, so I would almost say as, as a community, the next step we need to take is once the banks have kind of got together and, you know, we've agreed on this journey, I think the next step is uh, around banks working with, you know, the ERPs because there's six, seven, eight of them that are the large ones which should cover a, a significant portion of our multilateral corporations and, you know, then the next level down to kind of work through this simplifying for the dialect. So work with the Payments Canada as well as work with other industry bodies on how we do that. But then... Actually, you have to work through the whole plan. It's almost like the banks went through the whole ISO journey with yep. you know, all of the testing that we had to get done, which was still a struggle even when we went live. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing that has to get done for the corporate space. And, and I think um, it's, it's required of us now to move beyond the, the talking and getting into the action of creating those working groups and then, you know, you know starting to walk down that road. So that, that's what I would say. And, and maybe... Um, <coughs> Just to add to that, I, th I think there's only so much our corporates are going to be able to do in this, right? We're, we're, we're asking them to change processes, but there's only so many processes we can change. And I think, you know, when we talk about the different dialects, there's now more in common than there ever has been before um, with, you know, nuances in, in, in these dialects. So I think also we as the, the banking committee also need to think about, you know, how do we, on the one hand, um, you know, get our, our clients to start filling in this, this data in a different way, but on the other hand, insulate them a little bit from the complexities uh, that have been created across the dialects and do some of the work for them. Thank you. Bryce, thank you for your question. How should banks align to support the many different use cases of structured remittance information when corporates are so different across the industry? Well, I think in the first place, 
it's, it's, it's a question of how do banks agree to use remittance information and then make this transparent back to their back to their corporates. And I believe at this point in time, the usage of remittance information anyhow is is still limited. And which come back to my, my, my earlier point. If we adopt ISO as a banking industry and we want to make use of rich information like remittance information to the benefits of corporates, we need to ensure we adopt it natively. And we don't change something within our own process. And at the end, the structured remittance information looks different than it looked at the beginning. And the value for the corporate is gone. Same what's true. If the starting, the, the ordering party bank is providing remittance, structured remittance information solution for their clients and assuming all other banks in the chain have agreed to it, then we need to ensure that the information travels exactly the same way as initially provided. So I think the banks, first and foremost, need to, need to ensure that their infrastructure and their pipes are capable of supporting structured remittance information. And then I believe there are plenty of use cases which individual banks can discuss with their corporates on how to make use of it for reconciliation purposes, for providing additional information for regular regulatory purposes for preventing fraud and so on and so forth. You know, I, I think it, I think it also comes back to the you know the the ERP conversation as well, and, and the corporates in terms of you know they have their back end accounting systems that are going to be um, using this, and how we as an industry also advocate with those providers um, to ensure that they create some consistency. I mean, you know. Certainly, all all corporates are different, but there is you know a limited number of tools that they use across the corporate space, um, and, and how can we sort of advocate to get those tools to be as aligned as we're trying to be aligned in terms of you know the, this ISO format? There's a, an anonymous question. I'm going to ask it. It's the third one. Are the banks waiting for corporates to be ISO ready, or for the corporates waiting for the banks? <laughs> I no. I, I think I think banks. Um, so so it's a mixed bag. Uh, I know for a fact in, in Asia, the banks are, are pretty slow at picking this up. Uh, Asia, probably the Middle East, Africa as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're pretty slow at picking it up. But I don't think it's necessarily related to whether corporates are doing it or not. I think it's just uh, probably a, a lack of understanding on, you know, and the fact that it's, it's not mandatory, it's coexistence. Um, you, even when you look at things around you just, you know, local high-value payment systems which have moved to uh, ISO 2022, we found in many markets that, you know, some, some uh, party comes in and provides some type of a translator service. Yeah, right? a layer. So, so I think, I think what, what, what is really the struggle is, is for banks to, you know, commit to that investment that they need to make. So I don't think necessarily at this point in time banks are thinking about the corporate versus the... the um, bank getting ready for for that I think it's it's some very fundamental uh, decisions they need to make and it's in fact a discussion I had with Swift yesterday on what are we doing around things like transaction manager is there an opportunity for us to create some kind of bridging effect between you know those banks that you know 11,000 odd banks getting onto it is, is certainly going to be a challenge so how do we do that but I don't necessarily think at this point it's corporates first or banks yeah, no, what, I, what I would say is that I, I think many of the corporates don't even understand um, what's going on with ISO, um, and uh, you know certainly uh, to the extent of what, what the benefits are. So I think again, I think a lot of it has to do with um, we as banks describing this to our corporate clients and letting them know, you know, here's what's going on, here's what you can get out of it if you actually do these things. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's less about who's waiting for who, um, and especially in the corporate space, I think there's still, and you mentioned the, you know, training, and I think there's a lot of education that still needs to happen with the corporate community um, in order to get them excited about this. I think it's good that we have a panel like this one where we talk about benefits for corporates and create a common message out to the corporates from a banking industry as well that yes we started the iso journey and yes we on the banking side have to invest a lot of it but ultimately we don't do it just because we like iso 20 or 22 but we like to do it for the benefit of the corporate mm -hmm. to support them in their daily business and i think that message has to come across to support the business case on both sides for corporates to invest as well as for banks for sure, because as we've been having this discussion, I'm just thinking about all the business cases that have to be written at all the corporates, plus all the banks, in order to really drive and deliver the value that's required in the investment to, to even get there. There's a question here that's been shared on some examples of how ISO will help corporates audits and auditors. Perspectives. I think that would come down to again, you know, the rich data that would be available in 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 the the payment messaging that goes back and forth. And 
things around, you know, the compliance checks that would have to be done. So certain industries obviously have far higher, you know, levels on compliance. Uh, so for some of those, this, this type of information will certainly ease the burden on, you know, a number of manual workarounds that they tend to have to do. And then, you know, store the records of all of that so that when auditors come in, they can check it and stuff like that. So I, I do believe this will, you know, uh, alleviate some of those uh, challenges around having to do many manual processes and keep records and stuff like that, that, that today is probably happening in a number of large corporates. So I think, you know, that I would say the data, the structure, the information, the ability to then do all of that electronically would certainly help. And I think, you know, going back to an earlier point too, I think some of it has to do with um, having different types of data in one place. And I think, you know, one of the challenges for auditors um, and for, you know, this is a question about corporates, but, you know, for banks in interacting with our auditors is just collecting the information, right? So you can actually, um, you know, analyze it and do the job. And I think it's that, that collection process is going to be much easier because you're not going to have to do it in so many different places in order to find um, these disparate types of information. So I think that'll help. I'm not an auditor myself, but I can imagine our entire firm, from a Deloitte perspective, the auditor saying, yes, this data is going to help us with all the testing that we do, beginning to end, for sure. So I do agree, more information, more data will only make for a more efficient and effective uh, audit, for sure. Um, a question here from Neha, is there a catalyst that panelists foresee that will move adoption realization benefits from this slow, slow drip to an accelerated pace? I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think I think one of the catalysts is going to be when the U.S. migrates. Um, uh, so you, you know, for the um, audience, you know, the chips system in the U.S. is going to migrate to ISO uh, next year, and then the Fed system in um, in 2025. And you know, Canada has, has gone, Europe has gone, many of the countries in Asia have already gone, but there's um, you know, such a large U.S. dollar flow uh, in the world and, you know, running through SWIFT and, and all of our banks. Um, I think that might be a catalyst in terms of um, those clearing systems moving to the um, ISO. is going to force a lot of change and a lot of increased adoption, um, which, again, you know, back to the, you know, all the conversation we're having, we all have these great ideas in terms of how we're going to see the benefits, um, but we need the data. Um, in order to do it. So I, I think that um, we may see a catalyst in terms of the, the US dollar migrating from the clearing system. And to, to add to that, there are two perspectives. To it. The catalyst in terms of building the pipes is definitely the local RTGS migrating to ISO 2022. It's the end of the coexistence period, which is coming closer, end of 2025. And I believe as well the G20 discussions around cross-border mm -hmm. payments driven out of CP the, the CPMI, defining standards how to interoperate, defining standards for ISO 2022, that helps to build the pipes. At the end, I believe the key catalyst, once the pipes are there, is the data which we pump into the system. And that's then again on the corporates as well to clean up their data sets and make use of structured address information and utilize the additional fields like purpose code information to really reduce the the non-STP payments in the system. And then I think once we see this benefit being materialized, it will automatically increase, increase, increase. And we see much more adoption, not only within the banks, but as well on the corporate side. But I agree with AJ, the key, the key catalyst that for the time being is the local RTGS systems migrating. And, then, and one other thing, just to add on to what you said, I think you know, we've probably listed like 15 different you know, potential benefits or use cases, but you know, as always, with, whether there's something innovative or something new that nobody's really done before, we don't actually know which one is going to be the one that, that sticks. Um, so I think to some extent, it's, we're going to see what the catalyst is, right? Like we're, we're going to you know, all talk to our clients and do things internally. Um, and you know, one, of, one or two of these use cases we've all talked about will rise to the top. Um, and I think you know, that'll hopefully spiral um, and be a catalyst for more. And I think a conversations like this will serve as catalyst as well. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm witnessing a shift. If you look at the just the program, you know, at Cybos this year, how many sessions are related to ISO? And personally, at Payments Canada, we've had corporates actually reach out to us. Um, I had an interview with a Canadian chartered accountant just to talk about the ISO benefits. So conversations like this, education, you know, when people start to understand the benefits, they don't see it as a barely, you know, a compliant or a compliance issue. They see, okay, this is something I want to jump on the ship. So you see some leapfrogging happening as well with our corporates. Definitely. David, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I, I think um, <coughs> the other piece is when, when the ERP and TMS providers also come to the party. I think that's, that's going to be quite critical. And for that, there's going to obviously have to be 
stronger engagement from banks and, and SWIFT and corporates to make that. It's, it, it takes a few multinational corporations to get on the journey and, you know, we can see things moving quicker. And the U.S. dollar chips one is, is definitely one of those that will cause that. Uh, pivot, a pivot moment yeah. for all of us, for sure. There's a the question here from Chris on the line around ISO as a huge opportunity to transform O2C and P2P processes. What do you see the barriers for corporates to actually extract those benefits? I actually don't. Um, to me, it's not barriers. The, the, the way I've been looking at it is, you know, we're seeing many more corporations asking or moving into, you know, digital commerce and those types of business models. And uh, I actually think ISO, with the standards it has, and you know the syntax and stuff that you were talking about, XML and JSON and the like, uh, allows us to lend very nicely into a digital commerce world, which all happens in that realm. We you know with the APIs and and, and the like. Uh, once with that, with open banking, with a standardized uh, payment message format, um, you can actually see things moving much quicker. Uh, because you've now almost, you know, we talked about the dialects and stuff like that. This this is really has that ability to give people a standardized rail almost for payment instructions and to be able to get information back that are then allows that whole order to pay and, you know, order to collect and uh, purchase to pay cycle, uh, which will happen in digital. Because we will see far more corporates moving into digital commerce as well as a complement, if not uh, replacing. And I think having these standards with instant payment schemes going on it and stuff like that is really going to be um, something that I actually see people being more and more inclined to do rather than looking at it as a barrier because yeah. it really does simplify things. Yeah, I, I would agree, actually. I think it's much more of an opportunity than a barrier. And I'm just, just sort of add on to what you're saying. I think the, the biggest um, sort of unsolved problem we all have now in P2P is the cross-border element, mm -hmm. um, and ISO helps solve that problem, right? I mean, you're thinking about you know P2P within a domestic area, um, that that's largely uh, been solved through through various different mechanisms, um, but it is hard to do P2P across countries. Um, but now you're going to have countries and and SWIFT and um, all speaking, you know, dialects aside, like basically you know largely a similar language, which is going to make it all the easier to do P2P. Um, in a cross-border way. So I think there's enormous opportunity coming from this. We've got a question here around corporate mindset. I feel like we've touched it on already, but I'm going to just double click on it. So it's how do you change the corporate mindset from insulate me from complexity to being an advocate for ISO adoption? Um, I think, as we mentioned before, sessions like this are great, but it's this also, I think, AJ, you mentioned a little bit of almost like the co-creation and collaboration with the, the corporates as well as we start unlocking and figuring out which use cases are actually going to rise to the top. Any any other things to add on that? I think, you know, another thing is uh, which lens you choose to see it, right? I hate for people to see the ISO adoption as a compliance issue. Mm. It's very tempting to do just the bare minimum to stay mm. compliant or not. <laughs> but if you, you know, if we do enough education and people do see the benefits, you would be like, I want to do this because I see down the road it's going to help me with reconciliation, with you know, audit, all that benefits down the road. That's why I want to do it. Not because I'm forced to, I'm asked to. That's how I see it. It's changing the lens. And I think the other part, to add, if, we, if we look at the cross-border payments today, and GPI is a good I indicator, a lot of payments are already executed within, I don't know, I think 100% within 24 hours, um, and the majority within 50 minutes. So it's not actually the speed, but I think it's the predictability and avoiding exceptions and investigations handling on top of it. So I think what we need to understand, and I just read on, on a SWIFT presentation, that the exception investigation volume grow three times more than the payment volume over the last three years. So there must be something wrong in the way how we currently execute payments, which impacts all the corporates because they wait for their payment to be executed. We have a lot of questions back. So predictability, I think, is the key piece, which we can sell as as the benefit for the corporates. If we are able to adopt ISO 2022, we get the rich data into the system in order to make it predictable. Because the timing of execution goes back to the P2P part as well. Must not be the issue if we look at the, the GPI data today, but it's more the predictability that once you have executed a payment, like you know it from your domestic payment schemes, it's really ending up with the end beneficiary and it's not stuck somewhere in the middle. Predictability and I'd say certainty, right? Uncertainty. Like th that, that bit for a corporate treasurer, fundamental. 
for sure. We're uh, running close to the end of the panel, so if there's any other burning questions, please do get your last one in. Um, I'm going to open the floor to kind of, we've talked across the entire realm. We've thrown a number of use cases and examples out. We've talked about certainty. We've talked about collaborating um, with corporates, with bankers. Um, the flywheel of effect of all this data is also going to help to support. David used supply chain as an example, as being a fundamental use case that will actually benefit and the decision making that would go alongside that to help, you know, very much drive liquidity into the system. So many great examples. Anything else that we weren't able to touch on? I'll start with you, Christian. Well, I think we already captured a lot of things. Um, and I'd just like to <laughs> re-emphasize one thing which is um, quite to my heart, which is around data quality. We can build as good as possible infrastructure. We can all adopt ISO 2022 natively, which I think is something to be done for the banking industry. But we really need to think about the quality we put into the system. And we see it as of today, the ISO messages, the payment messages we receive, they lack this level of quality, which would be required to be really successful. So data quality. And the other thing to repeat as well and to recall as well, there is an end date for it, right? So we as a banking industry agreed on a end date of a coexistence period. So at least we are forced to do something and to get rid of empty messages. And the earlier we can sell this benefit and the associated um, relief to the corporates, the better it is for us to make use of ISO 2022 and defend the business case internally as well as externally. To Judy's point, so it doesn't feel like a compliance exercise. There's way more to it, for sure. Yeah. David, your view? I, I, I think to me the whole collaboration piece is going to be key with you know the ERPs, the TMS, and the like, because uh, corporates can only do so much. It's really their, their platform system providers that will have to do a lot of work. Corporates will still have to make sure the data they put in is clean and that it's capturing country code and you know all of that stuff that really needs to be done. So there is effort that corporates need to be to put in, but I think it's absolutely imperative that we get the ERPs and the like TMS providers, you know, to start engaging on this journey because uh, otherwise I think that November 25 is going to be a, an interesting discussion. <laughs> Challenging. Yeah. It's coming quick. Yeah. Thank you. Judy. Yeah, so I want to reinforce, um, emphasize the end-to-end -end adoption. So if we're going back to the, the analogy being a language, it doesn't help anyone if half of the people speak one, a dialect or another speak a different language or a different dialect. So end-to-end -end adoption, so that means uh, coherence. Um, so I want to call out everyone, if you are an, an expert in this space, please keep advocating. If you're new to this, keep getting educated. If you're starting to get curious in this, get involved. It's only when we're all of us speaking the same language that huge benefits can be unleashed. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, and I, mean, I agree with everything. I would just maybe um, one thing to add is you know, as, we, as we think about the benefits and we you know look internally and describe them to the corporates, think about both sides. So not just focusing on the efficiencies, which are I think going to be um, you know very beneficial, but also on the insights and the value-added services. So to make sure we look at both sides of the equation. Terrific. Thank you, AJ. And I can see we don't have any other questions that have come up. So this is the, the conclusion of it all. Um, hats off, we finally had a conversation about that real benefit that's going to be delivered in the future. So thank you to the esteemed panel that's joined me this morning. Uh, we've represented the global banks. We've represented Payments Canada in particular from an infrastructure perspective. And I think we've covered the entire geography of the world. <laughs> and it's great to have this conversation. And I look forward to having you guys again. I almost feel like five years from now, we should be back here <laughs> having this conversation conversation to see what benefits have been realized. So the good news is that all this data has been captured, it's videoed, so we'll be able to do a playback as well before <laughs> we get together. On behalf of the entire audience that's here with us in Toronto, along with those who've joined us remotely, thank you very much for joining this morning. A very lively debate and look forward to connecting again on the various social channels that I know that we're all plugged into as well. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.